Good morning. Okay. So what we're doing today is going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I have been sitting on a book from the library. Um, Christopher Dell's The Occult, Witchcraft and Magic and Illustrated History. Um, it's a compendium of a lot of different aspects of study, metaphysical study. So I'm going to break this into two parts. And it has a whole lot more than what I'm bringing to you. Um, but these are the ones that interested me. And for the beginner in metaphysical studies, you might want to see if you can check this book out from a library or interlibrary loan it. But this information is intertwined in the way that I keep saying, if you study long enough, different subjects will touch each other and you'll get a deeper understanding each time you revisit the subject um, through history and other people's interpretations um, of different occult metaphysical aspects. Um, so further ado, no further ado, I'm going to um, start off with Toth from this book. And it says, usually depicted as a man with the head of an ibis or as a baboon, the Egyptian god Toth was originally associated with the moon. However, because moon cycles play a large role in astrology, over time he became associated with magic. Toth was also the god of wisdom and the dead and the inventor of writing, the scribe of the gods. Toth's later importance in magic stems from the Greek conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great in 332 BC and the subsequent conflation of Toth with the Greek god Hermes. The Greeks were fond of finding local equivalents to their own deities. The Greeks saw Toth as the god not only of magic, but also of astronomy and astrology. Eventually, the association of Toth with Hermes led to the emergence of a new figure, Hermes Trismegistus. The main temple of Toth was to be found at Hermopolis Magna, formerly the Egyptian city of Khmun. Attributed to the god is the mysterious book of Toth, first mentioned in a fictional story from the Ptolemaic period. It was said to contain spells for talking to animals and seeing the gods. The title was since has since been applied to many collections of esoteric writings. Egyptian magic came to the fore again in the 19th century and with it renewed interest in Toth. Written by Aleister Crowley in the 1940s, the Book of Toth provides instructions on the use of the so-called Toth deck, a set of tarot cards co-designed by Crowley and Lady Frida Harris. Okay, my early beginnings in hermetic studies, um, hermetic interchangeable with metaphysic, metaphysic um, studies, led me to tarot cards. I was, I was drawn to tarot cards and thereby ended up with oracle cards. Um, Tarot has its own um, specific layout. Oracle cards tend to be a different kind of organic. But moving along in this book, that was the chapter on Toth. Now we have magic in the Old Testament. Magic appears only irregularly in the Old Testament. This is the Bible. Um, with most mentions being prohibitions on witchcraft and sorcery. It is unclear whether or not magic is thought to exist physically, and if that is the case, what kind of sources it taps into. 
The two best known magicians in the Bible are the Egyptians Janus and Jambres. Although they are not mentioned by name in the Old Testament, Jewish tradition describes them as the chief magicians who produce magic in front of Moses and Aaron in Exodus chapter 7 verses 10 through 12. When Aaron throws down his rod, it becomes a snake through the power of God. Janus and Jambres then match the trick, but using sleight of hand, whether they are mere conjurers or demonically inspired is uncertain. Aaron's snake then eats theirs. In David, Two, sorry, Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, troubled by dreams, summons the magi magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. None can help him, however, none can help him, however, and only the divinely inspired Daniel is able to decode the dreams another victory for God over false idols. An apparent and unusual reference to magic can be found in 1 Samuel 14 verse 41, where mentions is made, mention is made of two obscure objects, the Urim and Thummim, said to be stored in Aaron's breastplate. These objects are used in an act of divination to separate the guilty from the innocent. Now, the term Urim and Thummim sparked my memory because I read The Alchemist. This thing seems to be messing up now. Just a moment. My internet connection may not be what it's supposed to be right now, but let me see if I can pull this up again. Slow moving technology, <laughs> it's coming. I just had it pulled up. I was prepared. I pulled this stuff up in advance, y'all, but this um, internet connection apparently is acting up today. Another second or two. Okay, buffering, and there is the link. Okay, from sparknotes.com, because I looked up Melchizedek and the Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Because there was a, a reference, I remembered the reference of Melchizedek using Urim and Thummim. So here we go as it opens up. Melchizedek, who claims to be the king of Salem, appears to Santiago as an old man living in the Spanish town of Tarifa. And although he appears only briefly in the book, he plays an important role as he introduces several of the key concepts that we see repeated throughout The Alchemist. For example, he tells Santiago about personal legends, the soul of the world, and beginner's luck. He also gives Santiago two magical stones, Urim and Thummim, which represent yes and no, respectively, to help guide him on his journey. Melchizedek is also the first character in The Alchemist to display magical powers. Those powers help him convince Santiago to pursue his dreams of finding a treasure near the pyramids in Egypt. By his own account, 
Melchizedek plays a role in the lives of everyone who pursues his or her personal legend. He essentially motivates people to continue pursuing their personal legend in times of doubt, as he does when he meets Santiago in the novel. Although he appears to Santiago as a flesh and blood man, he explains that he appears to people more often as a symbol or idea. Evidently, he has been serving this purpose for a long time as he remembers helping the biblical Abraham in his own journey, even, well, even when Melchizedek is not physically present, the magical stones he gives Santiago help Santiago to remain hopeful and focused as he pursues his personal legend. So people have been drawing references um, to different things for a long time. And I wanna say that as you're studying, I was, I was told a long time ago um, when reading different books on Islam that I needed to be wary of a person's intentions in writing the book. Like what was this person's intention for writing this book? You know, was it a personal interest? Was it a spiritual interest or something other than that? And so even reading this text, the um, Occult Witchcraft and Magic Illustrated History, um, these are humans writing stories that they've researched. This is a human writing stories that he's researched from information gathered by other humans <laughs> and we know um what is that the grapevine when you play the grapevine game you start off with one message and can possibly end up with a totally different message by the time the 15th person hears what was supposedly said by the first person um take all things with a grain of salt use your personal discernment um i have backed out of studying a number of different things because it did not align with <laughs> my personal legend um and it went against being connected to the most high that's my motivation being connected to the most high having a deeper better understanding of what we're supposed to be doing here why we're supposed to be doing certain things and just the information that helps along the way so um i wanted to mention that also, when talking about Aaron, I looked up Aaron. I looked up Aaron and I looked up Melchizedek in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. <laughs> um, the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary by Charles Fillmore um, has Aaron listed as illumined, enlightener, mountaineer, very lofty. Okay, brother of Moses of the Israelish tribe of Levi and first high priest of Israel, metaphysical Metaphysically, <clears throat> he is the executive power of divine law. Aaron, the first high priest of Israel and the bearer of intellectual light to the Israelites, signifies the ruling power of the intellectual consciousness, the making of the molten calf by Aaron in Exodus 32 verses one through eight, signifies the false states of thought or idols that man builds into his consciousness when he perceives the truth, but does not carry his spiritual ideas into execution, choosing instead to let his thoughts function in a lower plane of consciousness. In Exodus 40, 12 and 13, Aaron and his sons typify spiritual strength, which becomes the presiding directive power of a new state of consciousness. Through spiritual strength, there is set up an abiding thought action that contributes to the building of the holy temple or the redeemed body. 
a lot of what's in the Bible and other holy books is uh, written in parables. So you need to understand the context of the symbolism that's being used. You need to be able to recognize the symbolism and to understand the context, which the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary helps with. So um, building of the holy temple or the redeemed body, bringing Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting and washing them with water, oh, excuse me, bringing Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting and washing them with water means that we should declare spiritual strength to be the presiding directive power of this new state of consciousness, not a mere animal strength, but a strength purified by all grossness of sense. The declaration of strength is absolutely necessary to permanency of the body tab tabernacle. Through it is set up an abiding thought action that continues while one's action while one's attention is elsewhere. So maintaining your spiritual focus, even though you may be getting information from different um, aspects. Aaron continues to minister to his priestly office, minister in his priestly office. All right, let me slide down to what it says about Melchizedek. Okay. He is the king of righteousness, righteous rule, upright counselor, righteous judgment, king of justice. He is also known as the king of Salem and the priest of God most high, who brought forth bread and wine for Abram on his return from the slaughter of the heathen kings who had taken Lot captive. This is in Genesis 14, verse 18, and he, Hebrew? Seven, chapter 7. Of Jesus Christ, it was said that he should be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is from Psalms 110, verse 4, and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6. Metaphysically, the divine will established in man is righteousness, justice, and peace. King of righteousness, king of justice, king of Salem, Salem meaning peace, or Salam, Arabic or um, from Hebrew, Melchizedek really refers to Christ mind or superconscious, superconsciousness, that which when ruling in man's consciousness establishes and maintains right doing, perfect adjustment, peace and perfection. Alrighty, getting back to <clears throat> Mr. Dell, I'm going to go on to King Solomon. And as I said, there's a whole lot more in this book than what I'm reading, but these are the ones that interested me the most or that I um, came across in my personal studies. Okay. Solomon king of ancient Israel from about 970 to 930 BC is perhaps best known as the son of David. In the Bible, he is portrayed as a wise and just ruler, the architect of the first temple of Jerusalem, but ultimately as a man who turned his back on God, descended into idolatry and was punished for it. In the centuries that followed, however, a huge collection of stories grew up around Solomon that portrayed the king as a great magician and keeper of arcane knowledge. Solomon is said to have possessed a magical ring known as the Seal of Solomon. The motif of the ring was the Star of David, and this image appears regularly in subsequent Western magical symbolism. Later tales of the king from the first century AD onwards tell of how the ring gave its owner control over animals and the weather. In the Apocryphal Testament of Solomon, the king uses his ring to command demons to build the first temple. Much later, this temple would become the archetype for all Masonic lodges, while Masonic initiation ceremonies still recreate episodes from the temple's construction. 
The motif of Solomon's ring is occasionally depicted as a pentagram, a symbol that also became associated with magic in the West. The five-pointed star was seen as a talisman capable of warding off demons. Now, I watched a documentary that talked about um, the Star of David in reverse, which is usually um, combined visually with a, a ram's head, um, and that being symbolic of Satan worship or, you know, certain ch Church of Satan type activities. So in the Star of David form, it is positive spirituality in the reversed upside down form it's of you know evil intent such was solomon's fame as a magician that two later books of magic bear, bear his name the key of solomon dated from the 14th or 15th century and the lesser key of solomon compiled in the 17th century Together, they cover divination, the creation of magical objects, magical operations, and the summoning of demons and angels. All right, moving on from there, Hermes Trismegistus. All righty. Now, considering how central... Hermes Trismegistus is to the history of magic and alchemy. I looked up alchemy. I'll get back to that. Um, we know surprisingly little about him. This is mainly because he is mythical. His origins can be traced back to the Egyptian god Toth, the god of magic and writing, as well as the guide to the underworld. When the Greeks under Alexander the Great conquered Egypt in 332 BC, they saw in Toth the equivalent of their god Hermes, who was also the god of magic and writing. And so a new cult was born centered on the town sacred to Toth, Kamun, which henceforth became known as Hermopolis Magna. Over time, the legend of Hermes Trismegistus acquired additional color. In the second century BC, the Jewish writer Ardapanu in his account of the life of Moses, drew a parallel between Moses and Toth. The Roman writer, the statesman Cicero, meanwhile, invented a backstory that had Hermes killing the hundred-eyed Argus before fleeing to Egypt, where he taught the Egyptians writing and law, with the Egyptians calling him Toth. The first concrete reference to Hermes Trismegistus are to be found in the Greek magical papyri. In one such reference, he is called Hermes the Elder, chief of all magicians. In another, he is re referred to as thrice great, since in ancient Egypt, the superlative was constructed by repeating a three time, a word repeating a word three times, Superl superlative, uh, tongue twister, means of the highest quality or degree. So to emphasize something's quality or high degree, it's repeated three times, hence the name Trismegistus. Justice. Mm -mm -mm. Yet another reference, this one taken from a spell, underlines his unique powers Come to me, Lord Hermes, many named one, who knows the king who knows the things hidden beneath heaven and earth. Central to our understanding of Hermes Trismegistus are the Hermetica, particularly the seventeen or so texts that make up the Corpus Hermeticum. The first text in the Corpus Poimandris describes the spheres of the seven classical planets. Each of the planets corresponds to an aspect of the human soul, Mercury to intelligence, Venus to love and lust, and so on. 
Indeed, this microcosm macrocosm concept runs through the entire Hermetica, being most evident in the Emerald Tablets. All right, we'll um, get to that also in a bit. Early Christianity. Our next section is magic in early Christianity. All right. The New Testament contains a few examples of magicians who convert to Christianity. The best known among them being Simon Magus, who had bewitched the people of Samaria. Paul in the epistle of the Galatians condemns magic as a work of the flesh, while Didache, an instructional Christian treatise from the middle of the first century states clearly, thou shalt not deal in magic, thou shalt do no sorcery. The apocryphal stories that followed through the lives of the saints in Jacobus, the Voragines, Jacobus, the Voragines, medieval bestseller, The Golden Legend, were even richer in magic. In the early Christian era, condemnations of other religions as being magical were common. So in order to discredit something, you all, um, you align it with uh, the word magic so people won't, won't, pay, won't pay it as much attention. Mm. Let me check this thing out here, excuse me. Why does that not seem to be doing what it's supposed to be doing? Okay. Let's oh, it is. Okay, never mind. Um, yes, so in, early, in the early Christian era, condemnations of other religions as being magical were common. The same accusations were leveled against Jesus and his followers by contemporaries. Nevertheless, Coptic texts from the second century show that early Christianity still contained strong magical elements, including invocations to the Holy Trinity as part of spells. Clearly, there was a balance between indigenous folk magic and the new religion. All right, moving next to Hermeticism in the Renaissance. This volume of Hermetic writings translated by Marsilio Ficino in the early 1460s, the Corpus Hermeticum consists of a wide range of texts from collections of spells and rituals to astrological and alchemical treatises. The text arrived in Florence in Greek but were believed originally to have been written in Egyptian during the time of the pharaohs. It was not until the early 17th century that the scholar Isaac Casalban proved that the version of Greek used in the text dated them to somewhere between the second and fourth centuries AD, making them about the same age as the Greek magical papyri. For Ficino, the others, however, the Corpus Hermeticum prove, sorry, and others. For Ficino and others, however, the Corpus Hermeticum provided an authentic, unique insight into truly ancient magic, perhaps even tapping into the occult knowledge of Moses. The work titled Poimandres, for example, is a dialogue between God, 
Poimandris, and Hermes, in which Hermes acquires insights into the workings of the universe. More philosophy than religion, it nevertheless spurred on the study of alchemy, astrology, and most dangerous of all, thurgy, which is defined as the operation or effect of a supernatural or divine agency in human affairs. Another definition is a system of white magic practiced by the early Neoplatonists. Alrighty. How could this ancient thinking be reconciled with Renaissance Christian thought? Both Ficino and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola promoted the idea of a Prisca Theologica, a single theology uniting all spiritual traditions. Essentially, Ficino wanted to create a single line of Gnostic wisdom going back to the most ancient times. Now, the definition of Gnostic is relating to knowledge, especially, especially esoteric, mystical knowledge. Esoteric is defined as intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with special, specialized knowledge. Okay. Um, so, yeah, especially Ficino wanted to create a single line of Gnostic wisdom going back to the most ancient of times to Zoroaster and Moses via Plato, Pythagoras, and Hermes. This approach also opened the door to such traditions as Kabbalah and led eventually to Rosicrucianism. All right. Next. We have alchemy. Let me jump back to the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary briefly for the definition of alchemy. Okay. And that is divine transmutation, transmutation changing in action and in character from the mortal into the spiritual or from the material into the spiritual. It has been said that the mind is a crucible in which the ideal is transmuted into the real. That is um, manifestation. Alrighty. So alchemy, the central premise of alchemy is that base metals such as copper, tin, or zinc can be transformed into precious ones, typically gold, but also the philosopher's stone via a process known as the magnum opus. Rooted in the material world, alchemy seeks fundamentally supernatural transformations in a more generic in a more general sense, however, the alchemical process is about achieving perfection, whether physical or metaphysical, chemical or spiritual. This split between physical and metaphysical worlds, both cloaked in symbolism and metaphor, makes the concept of alchemy initially difficult to understand. According to Zosimos of Panopolis, an Egyptian alchemist from the fourth century AD, the first true alchemist was Mary the Jewess, who lived at some point between the first and third centuries AD. Zosimos claimed the fallen angels, claimed that fallen angels had taught women the secrets of metallurgy. Here, Zosimos was already turning to ancient knowledge that of the Egyptians on the one hand and that of the Hebrews 
on the other. He also gave alchemy a spiritual dimension, seeing the alchemical vessel as a baptismal font. Alrighty, in physical alchemy, this book is heavy. <laughs> in physical alchemy, the principal apparatus is the alembic, which is used to distill chemicals. Many different types of alembic are used depending on the task at hand. Distillation, however, is just one of the techniques employed in alchemy, and the magnum opus originally had four stages, negrito, burning until black, albedo, purification, citrinitas, turning silver into gold, and rubedo, rubedo the creation of the philosopher's stone. The first stage could be achieved the dry way by fire, calcination, or the wet way by putrefaction. And it is exactly what it sounds like, uh, rotting and decay. A more in-depth version of the magnum opus has 12 stages the last of which is projection, a material that can be mixed with such metals as mercury to create gold. Success in alchemy was elusive and no straightforward recipes exist. Indeed, alchemists delight in obscurantism. <laughs> uh, basically the act of hiding or concealing something. Obscurantism and in hiding their secrets in hard to fathom diagrams, many of which are still not fully understood. Now, a reason for that might be that the original interpretations were based on spiritual, not physical um, understandings of moving one thing from a less pure to a more pure version of itself. And, or the other side of that would be because um, a lot of these things were taught to particular students who had studied long and hard in you know, the different aspects of what they needed to know to understand it properly. This is, you know, how they build up to higher knowledge. You learn the elementary stuff first and you move up to where you can handle the spe specialized information. But if people are materially focused, they won't look for that. <clears throat> um, look for that type of understanding versus a more material understanding. Continuing, fundamental to alchemy is the Emerald Tablet, supposedly written by Hermes Trismegistus, but found only in Arabic books from the 6th century onward. The tablet was allegedly discovered in a vault below a statue of Hermes in Tyana, an ancient city in the southern part of modern-day Turkey, where it was held by a corpse on a golden throne. With the Muslim conquests of Egypt in the 7th century, Egyptian ideas made their way back to the Arabian Peninsula. Physical alchemy flourished in Baghdad and Persia. Jabir ibn Hayyam, 721 to 815, known as Jabir, and that's the difference of J-A-B-I-R to G-E-B-E-R, in the West, developed a theory that all metals contain some sulfur and mercury, building on the Aristotelian belief in the four properties of hotness, coldness, dryness, and moisture. In the 10th century, the Persian scientist and alchemist Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Rizi Razi, from 865 to 925, known as Rasis in the West, wrote the Kitab al-Asrar, Liber Secretorum in Latin, 
which details the tools of the alchemist. Alchemy can also be found in China. However, although it is driven by the same goal, the transmutation of matter, as other alchemical traditions, the influence of I Ching, Taoism, and Zuzing, Wu Zing, excuse me, means the Chinese alchemy has a significant spiritual bias. Metals were thought to be male and female, lunar and solar. The key early work in Chinese alchemy is the Yellow Court Classic, which dates from before 4th century AD. Alchemy works of art are rich in symbolism. Often they are visually spectacular as well. Splendor Solus, the splendor of the sun, the earliest version of which dates to the 1530s, is the classic illustrated work on alchemy, explaining the, philoso excuse me, explaining the philosophy of the process. Over time, many other illustrated works often obscure often obscure emerged. One such is the Ripley Scroll, attributed to the English alchemist George Ripley, circa 1415 to 1490. The scroll describes the various steps of the 12-stage alchemical process. Less than two dozen copies of the scroll have survived. In alchemy, the seven classical planets are associated with the seven classical metals, the sun with gold, the moon with silver, mercury with mercury, and so on. Here we are in symbolism again, right? The symbols for each of the metals come from astrology. Similarly, each step of the 12 stage process is associated with one of the 12 signs of the zodiac, which are used as a sort of cryptic shorthand. Animals are regularly used to represent the different stages of alchemy. Thus, a white swan stands for whitening, a green lion for greening, and a pelican for reddening. The Ouroboros, Ouroboros, a dragon or snake devouring its own tail, is a symbol of the never-ending cycle of alchemy. The Caduceus, Two serpents entwined around a rod is another symbol for mercury, while the word cinnabar, used to describe a bright red mineral consisting of mercury sulfide, comes from the Persian for dragon's blood. Other images are determinedly strange, referring to the combinations of opposites, hermaphrodites, male and female, kings and queens. <clears throat> For Michael Mayer, writing in the 16th century, the true goal of alchemy was the unity of opposites. All right. With that, I'm going to end this video. Nope, hold on. 228. Just a moment. wanted to add the emerald tablets on here. Hold on a minute.
think I know what I did, needed to do. Well, I'm going to let that be it here then. If I come across it again later, I'll jump back in with what I'm thinking about. Let's see. Yeah, I probably went over it already. So with that, I'm ending this video and I will continue on the next one because 46 minutes is long enough. <laughs> Hang in with me. Join me for part two. All right.